Hi, everybody. Rich Wilkerson here. And I am so happy today to have my four sons on this wonderful Father's Day special. And uh, my oldest son is John Fulton. He pastors in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, my second born is Rich Jr. And I uh, know that he is about 10 miles south of me uh, here in Miami. And my third son is Graham. And he's here in Miami with me as well. And then Taylor, uh, our youngest, is up in New York City. And just thought it'd be kind of fun to get us all together today, talk about fathers a little bit, and uh, talk about Father's Day. And I want to just start with this passage, Psalms 127. And the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And uh, also in that uh, chapter, uh, verse 3, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. And so I'm a blessed dad to have had children born in my youth. And uh, hallelujah. So let's just start off with some questions here. I'm going to kind of start kind of around, around the clock here. What, what is something really funny that you remember growing up about me or something I said or something I did that you remember? Anybody? There was multiple times, which John Fulton can uh, attest to this, that you were kicked out of private Christian school basketball <laughs> games by... <laughs> In some cases, I think some referees that you might have led to the Lord, but we don't know how their faith journey is going now after you, you know, after you verbally assaulted them as the evangelist of our town. So there was a lot of things that you taught us, Dad, you know, anger <laughs> management, how to walk in peace during times of, you know, turbulence. No, I have so many memories. I think that you're one of the funniest people that I know. And so um, you're hilarious. You're a storyteller. I think we all learned how to tell a story sitting at dinner tables with you and traveling with you. I think we all learned the power uh, of a connection with people. And I think one of your greatest gifts is just emotional intelligence and social awareness and your ability to, to sense through nonverbal cues what other people are feeling. And I can just go back. Uh, I remember going on the road with you and to different places that you would preach. And it wasn't just your preaching, which was exquisite and amazing and so ahead of its time, but it was the way that you would handle yourself uh, in the back and at dinner tables with people and how you make people feel like they're on top of the world. And I think I've just learned so much uh, when it comes to relationships and relationship intelligence. Uh, you're thinking about funny stuff. I don't know if Joel, I, for some reason, dad always had like multiple colognes for like different sections of his body. I always remember that as a little boy walking in, it's like, this was for like his leg area. This is for like underarms. I'm like, how many sprays does a man need? I remember You'd come home from uh, the road, and I can remember that bathroom that you and mom had. It was, a, it was like a, a bathroom you guys shared a spot. And I have all these vivid images that you would all, you were always doing push-ups. Like in your, like, I think before you'd like do your spray down, and then you'd do like 25 push-ups on the floor. And so <laughs> I just remember this stuff, man. But um, you were making us laugh all the time. You still do. You're the funniest person I know. Taylor, anything from you? <laughs> The, the only thing that, that's coming to mind that has to do with what these guys are talking about is I just remember like you, you've always had such a strong sense of smell. Like, 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 like you've always had such strong opinions about how everything smells from our house to like, like everything. Like, like, yeah. like I remember like you picking up after a football game or something and like you would bring like garbage bags like to put all of my gear in because you would just didn't want the smell. You'd have all the windows down. Like maybe that was just me. Maybe that wasn't you guys. <laughs> but like he was just so anti. I, I remember like like um, like I interned at the church and you, you like had a sign where like you wanted no one to like ha eat tuna in the office. Like there's just been like all sorts of like like scent has been a huge part of your life. I remember one time I bought mom a perfume for her birthday. And, and, and afterwards you were like, son, that's really, I'm gonna buy mom her perfumes. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, <laughs> I was like, I didn't know that that was like a dad thing. My, my dad. He was always addicted, like, and you have an addictive personality and praise God, it wasn't drugs or women or money, but it was like, you had different types of mints that you would cycle through. Oh yeah. You had these one mints that were like, 
Yeah, like spit, you, you had a smint addiction. We should have invested in smints because you would go, <laughs> you'd walk into Walgreens and buy the whole box. The whole I think, case. Honestly, it was like a $28 a day habit. Yeah. Um, it's hard to preach against cigarette smoking when Alcoy you've got a smint, a smint addiction. Sin Sins, John Fulton I Mary used to find these in his suit pocket. And then dad would always make you feel dumb. Cause like, no matter what, like you could, you could just get done brushing your teeth. He'd be like, oh man, your breath. Like you weren't even asking for feedback, but he would tell you that your breath, you're like, oh, sorry. Like, <laughs> he just pop some, he just give me your hand. He just pop some mints in. Like, I'm like, man, I just use scope. Like there's no way that my breath is as bad as you. <laughs> That's funny. Hey, Graham, do you have anything? I remember when you went to the, to the airport and you cuss. What? It's true. Dad cussed at the airport one day. <laughs> uh, Is there a story atta attached to this? <laughs> he just cursed, man. He just walked in the airport, just cursed, turned around, left. I, I gotta say, I think the only ap appropriate place to curse is the airport. If, if you if you go to the airport and you haven't cursed, I want to meet you because uh, <laughs> you know Jesus in a deeper way than all of us. That's a good point. Okay, okay, look at look at we're look at. Uh, we may have to edit this out, but so we can exact ex so we can explain that there is an ex, ex I have repented, but John Fulton. <laughs> Do you remember the time? Can you tell the time, John Fulton? Do you, Taylor was too small. Graham's yeah. like five years old, and he still remembers it. So what happened? <laughs> yeah, so what happened was is that we were coming back from the East Coast through uh, Chicago O'Hare, and we were trying to make the connecting flight, and, <clears throat> you know, there was a delay, and uh, you were – you know, starting to get amped up. And it wasn't just us boys. We had cousins with us and the whole deal. And so, you know, it was kind of the scene out of Home Alone. I mean, we we're at Chicago O'Hare, you know what I mean? And we're running through the Chicago Air Airport. And I, <laughs> I remember we kind of dove into this elevator to go down to the next course and just kind of under your breath. It was kind of, I mean, it was more under your breath, but you just kind of dropped a an SHIT bomb, you know, just kind of under the breath. And uh, we all just kind of like, you know, and it was just, we never heard that before come out of your mouth, you know, and, uh, but we're all human, but I remember we, we, we got on the airplane and then, you know, you, you did the right thing and apologized and it was, it was good, but. Okay. Was, okay. Was, but now, too. but how did we apologize? Right. How did, how'd the apology go? Anybody remember that? I don't remember that. You had a family meeting. <laughs> And um, you, you publicly apologized because um, sins committed in public must be apologized in public. And so um, we, we as a family, we, had, we came together and we kept you in the tribe. We didn't vote you out, but there was talks of a stoning that I actually had uh, stopped. But uh, you no, know, you publicly yeah. apologized. I do remember one time when Graham had a cursing problem for a little bit. And uh, Graham wouldn't quit cursing. I think he'd washed his mouth out with soap. He tried a couple different things. And so finally, one day, you brought us all together. And you wanted to make sure we had extreme clarity, which is so important in relationships. So many relationships, disappointment comes from assumptions. And, you know, are we on the same page? And so you took us through, you took us through the thesaurus and the dictionary of curse words that were not allowed <laughs> in our house. And it was the first time I heard you use, I mean, there were some words I had never even knew were curse words that you introduced me to in your PowerPoint presentation of what words were not allowed. And, uh, <laughs> you, want, you wanted extreme clarity. Now, Graham, this word, bleep, we don't say that either. And the word bleep, 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 that's never going to work in a sentence structure. I mean, it was, it was fascinating. I, get, I got one more. I remember when we had first moved to Miami and that was a big culture shock and we were, you know, missing our friends from Seattle. And uh, I can remember Rich and I, especially, we were really upset about being there and we wanted to go home and all this kind of stuff. And, and we were just nagging you guys and man, this place is terrible. Why would you bring us here? All that kind of stuff. And I remember one night, Rich and I were so upset that we were sleeping in the same bed together, you know, in my room and we were just, you know, all we had and, and, we, I don't know what we had 
done to upset you know you so bad but you got to a place where you're just you, were, you had it and i'll never forget it you blasted through the door and you, you hit the lights you're like you're like you guys you guys think you got it bad you don't even know what bad is get in here and you took us into the uh, living room and you and you took the vhs tape out saving private ryan and you made us watch the entire Saving Private Ryan because if we if we think we had it bad, look at the, you, I'll never forget it. <laughs> you looked at me because I was getting ready to turn 18. You're like, this is what real 18 year olds had to go through. And you're, and, and you, you got to go to the beach tomorrow. You know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> now that is, that is family <laughs> abuse right there. <laughs> oh. oh, well. Uh, just so everyone knows, I did repent, and uh, I've told the story in front of the church a few times, so they know I've repented. Hallelujah. Hey, um, is there a scripture or a, a, a message or something that, that I said as a dad that stuck with you as a kid? Any, any Just kind of go around the circle. Anybody? Something that one of the... Well, it's, it's something, it's something that always stuck with me. Um, so, I hate Zoom etiquette, by the way. Like, yeah. Uh, that, oh, hey! Hey! Like, uh, and you kind of look at each other and like, you kind of just, I guess that's my yeah. turn. Um, you go for it. Something, so, something that's always, yeah. stuck, I, something that always stuck out to me. Um, it's a really small detail of, uh, of a sermon that was really known. I, uh, Anyone who's known me for a long time knows the sermon, I Want the Cross. Uh, you've preached it. Rich preached it around the world, made him famous. Um, <laughs> great sermon. And, and it's a powerful sermon where, obviously, for those of uh, listening to this who don't know, uh, the way it ends is people, the youth, make the commitment to follow Jesus. Really powerful, one at a time, stand up in the auditorium. I want the cross. And I remember the first time I did that, but... but um, and I did it multiple times uh, throughout my life, and it was always really powerful. But the thing that's the, that constantly comes back to me, and it's just it's so interesting. I thought of, I thought of it this morning. Was there's this part in your testimony that you always shared, and and you shared this detail because it must have stuck out to you. But it just it was one small thing. You always talked about how you got to a place in your ministry as a young man where you were you were capable of preaching the gospel without praying. You were capable of 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 delivering an excellent word for stirring people's emotions, but spending no time with God. And, and a big part of your story was how God broke your heart and you decided that that wasn't the way you were going to do it anymore. And, um, and as a, as a young man who started preaching, uh, much later in life than you, I was 18, but you were probably preaching when you were three. Um, that's always been something that's really stuck with me and has always kind of kept my heart in check when it comes to uh, delivering, uh, delivering the message of Jesus. So it's, it's honestly been something that's just like been such a huge part of, of my own development. And even this morning I had a gut check asking, you know, like, like just making sure that like whenever I'm preaching in public that I've, I've always done the work in private with the Lord uh, ahead of time, you know? So th that's something you really instilled in me. And that it's not even the point of that, of that story of that sermon, but like you, you would always drop that sentence, man, like I was preaching without praying. And that's just been something that's always constantly, it's just like in my head, constantly just reminding me to spend time with God and to start there uh, when, before I'm preaching the gospel. So I'm really thankful for that. So thank you. Wow. My own son. Somebody else. John Fulton? Well, yeah. I mean, one of the things that, you know, that you taught us and specifically me, you know, just the pursuit of wisdom and in our Christian context, and so you taught me a little um, exercise of, you know, there's 31 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, which almost align perfectly with the month. And so every day for years, I've just read the proverb that correlates with the day of the month. And so um, I've always appreciated that about you. And if, if, if you know, if I was even reading a ver Proverbs 15, okay, just to, just to read a, a, a verse, uh, verse 33 kind of sums up the theme of your life. And that is the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom and humility comes before honor. And so when I think about you and what you've taught me over the years, not only have you taught on honor and humility, you've lived it out. 
And um, I just, in my own life, I've seen, you know, uh, where I've been able, where I've been promoted in my life, maybe specifically ministry. It's when I was pursuing wisdom, honoring others and doing it with a very humble spirit. And so mm -hmm. you, you, you continually to this day live that out and you've set the bar uh, for us boys in that. And I think it's, I think it is the secret to a, a successful life and, and in our, in our uh, context in ministry. And I think that um, that nugget right there has, has changed me as not just a pastor, but a man. So wow. great. So good, Joe. Thank you, buddy. Rich. Yeah. I was just thinking as these guys are talking, I, I could go all day about things that I remember that you've taught us and things from the Bible and life messages. Um, I think one of the things that's I've, has had a profound impact on me now becoming a dad was that when we were younger, you, um, like Taylor said, I think sought the Lord before we were born and kind of gave a name or a label or a word over all of us. And for me, you always called me your child of courage. And it's just an interesting thing about the things that we hear about from a young age and the things that our father speaks over us in so many ways. Um, whether we feel that's our identity or not, we, we tend to live up to who his words or we tend to become whatever his words are. That's why there's probably some people that are watching right now that, that didn't have the advantage of having a dad like you. And because of that today, they're in many cases still floundering, trying to figure it out because they didn't have someone speaking identity and life over them. And you always just spoke that word courage over me. And I just think about the word to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. And over and over again, there's been multiple opportunities in my life for me to back down because of fear. And I'm sure that I have backed down because of certain obstacles because of fear. But, I, but I'm certain that anything that I have done in courage or anything that I have done where I face my fear, it's because I've got the voice of my dad in the background who was putting a God label over my life. And I think in many cases, I am who I am today because of the words of my dad and that when obstacles have come, when threats have come or when reasons to quit have come, I'm reminded, wait a minute, I'm a child of courage. So much so that my son Wyatt, when he was born, I said, this is Wyatt the brave and my son wild this is wild the courageous because that word so impacted me and still to this day at 36 years of age continues to impact me that i hope that i can speak life over them that when they're in their 30s when they're in their 40s when they're trying to be men of god in a very tough time a difficult time that they wouldn't be swayed by the crowd that they wouldn't be swayed by culture but rather they would live true to the calling that's you know, uh, that's come from god uh, in their life that they would be men of courage so that's just, that's the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about that, that I don't know what, I just remember John Bolton, I had bunk beds and he had the top bunk. We could tell some stories about that. I had the bottom bunk, but somehow mom had like an artist come into our room and um, on the wall, remember like in like calligraphy, John Fulton, it was like child of promise for JF and underneath me, it was child of courage. I don't know what the verse was underneath it, but it was like a verse with it. And so like, I'd go to bed every night seeing that. I think that stuff plays a huge, huge role. Um, in the development process of, of a child and of a human being. Yeah. Graham. Okay. Um, the cause from, from patch outline. <laughs> Graham says the message that impacted him was the cross. And he, some of you guys remember Graham went to to Alabama when he graduated from high school to be in Bible college uh, with Pastor yeah. Pat Chatsline. And <laughs> he never cared much for that message until he heard Pat preach <laughs> my message. And then that really impacted his life. <laughs> Not because I when, when, it, when Pat preached Pat your preached. sermon, that's when it connected. Only Graham would come up with that. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, what two things changed the most? We won't have Graham answer this one, but you other guys that have kids, he's still looking for a wife. No one's good enough for him. But uh, after you became fathers, what two things changed the most in your life? Joe? Joe? Unmute. 
Yep. Etiquette. Zoom etiquette. Um, yeah, I think right off, right out, right out of the gate, just uh, my capacity for love. I mean, I thought I, I thought I loved people. I thought I loved my brothers and my parents um, at, at full capacity. But then, you know, these little babies entered the world, and uh, that changed everything. I mean, I, not just my love for them, but my love for other people. You know, and so that's the first thought. The second thought is just the Father's love towards me. You know thinking about uh, him sending Jesus to this earth and that sacrifice and, and just, uh, uh, just a, a new revelation as uh, the beauty of what Christ did for us, but what the Heavenly Father did in, in sending Jesus. And so I just, uh, for me, I, I like got saved all over again. You know what I mean? Uh, so I think those right out of the gate were the top two. Yeah. Taylor's the youngest. Taylor, I want we jump to you before Rich. Yeah, um, man, what have I, what has changed? I think that's the, the big question. Um, the, the big thing that I've been kind of reflecting on lately about what's changed is uh, I read a really great book by a guy named Richard Rawlhauser that's called The Domestic Monastery. And he talks about how, how, how parenting and running your household is very much a place of spiritual formation, much like a monastery is. And, and, and he talks about how, uh, how like in a monastery, when the bell rings, that signals that, hey, it's time to pray. It's time for the spirit. Or the bell rings, hey, it's time for a meal. The bell rings, hey, it's time for work. And in a monastery, the idea is that when the bell rings, you stop what you're doing, even if you haven't finished, and you stop immediately. If you're writing, you stop in the middle of a sentence, and you move on to the next thing. And it's to build in a discipline to teach us that our time is not our own. And, and, the, and the concept is just very much like it's a discipline and it's very annoying, but you go, ah, I want to finish my meal or ah, I want to finish writing or ah, I want to finish my work. But I'm saying that my time's not my time. My time is God's time. And it is an, in, a, in a discipline to live your life, believing that all of it belongs to God. That's what monks do. Well, in a, in a household, you don't have a bell like, a, like in a monastery, but you do have a crying baby in the middle of the night. And when that crying baby cries in the middle of the night it's a reminder immediately that wow my time is no longer just my own time and and in the middle of the night you make these sacrifices that are very much building within us patience and gentleness and kindness in the middle of work when you're stuck in quarantine and your kids are interrupting you and you're trying to get something done that's that's the monastery bell ringing saying my time is not my own time and it's breeding and, and birthing within us um, a greater sense of patience and gentleness. So uh, I'm, I'm learning those things. I'm learning patience, gentleness. I'm learning that my time is not my own time. And I, I think it's teaching generosity in a way that's not just financial and, and of, um, earthly things, but it's, it, it, it's generosity with time and attention. I think attention is the greatest thing we can be uh, generous with. And I think that is the thing our kids need the most. And it makes me admire you and mom so much because of your ability to give us, uh, give us attention with such a busy life, with such a huge platform that you've had. Your ability to give your kids such attention was um, always so meaningful to us. So I'm figuring that out. So it's about time. Time's not my own. And I'm, I'm, I've learned that a lot. So. So good, Tay. Rich? Yeah, these are just incredible answers. And I would just echo what everybody said. I think what John Fulton was saying, I mean, I could go a long time on those things because I don't think I preach a sermon right now that doesn't have an illustration with one of my sons. Why? Because you, you discover God's love in a radical way. I was telling a story the other day about, about Wyatt. When Wyatt falls down, he's two years old. He always goes, Daddy, he goes, I hold you. I hold you. <laughs> and it's funny because his vocabulary is wrong, but so is his thought process. Um, it's actually me picking him up and holding him and he can't hold me. Although he says, I hold you. He actually means dad, hold me. And what a picture that we think we're holding on to God, but, but God's holding on to us. You know, we think that we, we can grasp God. We can't grasp God. God. God's grasping us and God's embracing us. And so week after week, I think I'm discovering the love of God. I think the same thing, what you're saying that the downward flow of love. Wow. Like my, my son peed on me yesterday. I was happy about it. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm over here. I, we think we're letting God down, but we were never holding God up. There's just the downward love of God. It's just well, let me receive this. And same with what, what Taylor's talking about. Just I'm learning patience, humility, and, 
empathy and I think it settled my soul a whole lot. I think I've always been a very ambitious, driven person. And uh, I think that's how God's wired me. And I think I'm a fast paced, do a lot of stuff in one day. And I still am, but I gotta be honest with you, there's a a piece that's come from being a dad that um, is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. It just, it feels like a, I I love how God gives us a genesis of new life to go, whoa, and waken our, our eyes. I was trying to lead into the question and just answer it honestly for me. And one of the thoughts that came to me as we're talking about this, I would say the word grace and truth. And maybe you guys can comment too, but I feel like once I had my boys, there's a level of me that like, I loved my childhood. I love you, dad, and love mom. And most of the time I feel like I look backwards and I kind of just, um, even though I went through a bad experience, I'm kind of like, that was good. You know, I just, that's sort of where I leave it. I'm just on to the next, on to the next. I feel like after I had my son, Wyatt, I started to really evaluate what was my childhood? What, what? I love my dad. Is there, is there improvements? Is there gaps? I love my parents. I love the way I was raised, but you start to like evaluate on a, on another level. But with that comes this other word, which is grace, which is, I feel like I'm like, Oh, anytime I was judging my dad, what were you thinking? It's like when you started church, you know, we all worked for dad <laughs> at one point. Now we all lead church. We're like now I get it. Oh, okay. Maybe I didn't understand fully there's this like immediate level of grace where i feel like when i started boo i'm like dad i just want to say sorry i was an idiot like because you 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 see it from a different vantage point and so there's this grace and truth on one level i'm trying to like i want to improve it all on the other hand i'm like Whew, I, let me call my mom and dad and say thank you again because how did you do it you know how'd you pull it off mm-hmm. beautiful uh guys we've gone a little long here but I want to get another two questions before we're in, but Graham, I don't know how I skipped over you, but we were talking before about what you, the kind of the greatest lesson you learned growing up in in the home. What was yours? Don't give up people. Graham says, don't give up on people. There's always, yeah, that's so good, son. Great job. True. Um, let me ask you guys as as fathers, um, what will faithful and effective Christianity look like to your children 20 years from now? Um, I, I'll go first. I, I really believe that you and mommy did such a good job and on father's day did such a good job at teaching us not just to love Jesus, but to love his church. And I think that that's a huge, I think it's just a huge part of it. Um, what does Jesus love more than anything? Well, he loves his church. Jesus is coming back for a people. He's coming back for the bride. He's coming back for his church. We are the church. We all know that. But, um, I'm convinced that if we can convince our children to love what Jesus loves most, that they will also, Jesus will make sure that they fall in love with Jesus. Like um, what does Christianity look like um, moving forward? I think it looks like um, for my children, I think my responsibility, I can't make my kids love Jesus, but I can really influence their viewpoint and how they think of Jesus's church. And if I can convince them that Jesus' church is good and that Jesus' church is strong, if I can convince them that the church is for them, that the church is amazing, the church is a great community, if I can get them to fall in love with the church, I know they'll fall in love with Jesus. Wow. And, and I think you did a really good, good job of making sure that we all love the church. I mean, we're all in ministry. So obviously uh, you did that. And, and I mean, like it's, I can't imagine that like, how hard it must be for parents to have kids who are running away from the Lord. And man, and I, and I pray for, for, for kids who are running from Jesus all the time with, with parents, but man, like your ability, mom, dad, um, what you and mom did is I think you didn't just model the way which you did. I, we heard you praying. We heard you with people. We watched you live your life. Like John Fulton talked about earlier, but, but a huge thing is you just, you, you helped us fall in love with the thing Jesus loves most. And that's his church. And because we love the church, we fell in love with Jesus too. So I think that's a huge thing. Introducing our kids to a healthy church, building a healthy church, a healthy community, being a part of that and falling in love with the church. So 
that's what happened in my life for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm the newest dad of the group. And so uh, my oldest is two years old. So I've got a little ways before I have to figure out where he's going to be at 20, but we're taking it day by day. I think ultimately um, our, our faith has has thrived during times of persecution. Um, it was never popular to be a Christian. Um, that I think it's I think it's built for the hard times. It's built for the difficult times. And so I think what happens in the home is imperative. And I think what our pursuit is going to be is to teach them the ways of Jesus, to teach them the person of Jesus, to teach them that you can discover the character, the nature, the qualities of God are found in this man named Jesus. And that's very, very exciting for me. And so um, telling the story right, making sure that they learn the values of the gospel and of the good news, to not live a life of convenience, but live a life of conviction and helping them navigate that our job and our pursuit has never been to just build big gatherings or to go to conferences and events, but rather it's always been to understand first and foremost that we're lost without him and then to fall in love with a personal relationship with him and be guided by the Holy Spirit and to boldly proclaim it, not just from a stage, but in our everyday life. So I think the, I think the concern for me is just at times, Growing up in our family or our homes, just Christianity can so look like another job or my dad is just another guy on this or that. And it's got to go deeper. And so hopefully, I think our greatest concern is to get past the superficial side of the projection of who we all are, that we've got, we all have a measure of influence on this call. And um, I don't want my kids just to grow up thinking that their dad is somebody. I want them to have their own intimate relationship with Christ. And so that's, that's the heart of what we're trying to do. And we don't know what the next 20 years is going to look like, but uh, there's going to be followers of Jesus if he hasn't returned because we know that from history and we know the promises of God. And so I want my boys to be two of them. And um, I think that's what we're working on. Yeah. And dad gave us that, right? I think, he, I think dad did such a good job, like teaching us to pray. I remember dad gave us our first Bibles. Do you remember that day, guys, when he sat us all down, he got us all a new Bible with our name on it. I remember, I mean, he took us, so many services where we were all at the altar weeping, having encounters with the Holy Spirit. I think all of those things play a huge part. It's not just one thing. It's a, it's a lifestyle. Health starts in the home, right? And it's just, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I, I agree. I agree with all of that. I think um, one thing that's important is that uh, for me is perspective. Uh, I know that the guys on this Zoom call right here are a very rare breed. And most of the people that are watching this right now didn't, didn't have it like we had it. Most families are so broken and uh, there is no model or example in the home at all. And so when people listen to our story, they can't, it's, it's hard for them to relate, you know? And so my daughter um, is nine and my son is five. And what I've really been, especially with my daughter, uh, the last couple of years is I've been trying to communicate to her and she's received it that everything that we have, you know, like the fruit of not just our, our family Israel, but like the fruit of, of our multi-generational family. It's all because of us, of us pursuing um, pursuing Christ and his church and what he wants for us. And so everything that we have is a result of following Jesus, you know? And, and so she's, she's learning that. In fact, I was joking with mom yesterday, uh, every morning when they're eating their, you know, their cereal and stuff, they, they've been watching Superbook. It's a, you know, Christian uh, on YouTube, Christian, you know, Bible stories and stuff. And, and they've just been like, They've just been absorbing it, you know, and, and um, so, so that's part of it. But the other half, the other part of it is for me, my prayer is that I, that I can be a man of character and, and just like model what it looks like in, in the home. Like you did dad, just model what it looks like to be a disciple of Christ. And because my kids are always watching to that when they, when they are, when they're in their twenties, they can look back and say, yeah, my, my old man had a genuine relationship with God. And so because of that, or, or whoever it is, you know, because of, because of the genuine relationship that I saw in, in the home that with God from my parents, 
Like I, I want that for my life. And that, that's how it was for me because <clears throat> I watched you preach on stage, but like you lived it, man. Like I, I can, I can hear you praying in the guest bedroom uh, as a little, a little boy that had such an impact on my life that, that it wasn't just to go out and get a paycheck to pay the bills and you had a gift to, to speak, but it was like, it was, it was who you were. Like you really believed in this stuff and actually living out what we, what we preach is, is just, is huge. And so that's, that's what I want to see for my kids is a genuine relationship with Jesus. Not because I'm trying to make them be that, but because they experience God for themselves. Wow. Um, I do want to ask what, what is the most cherished thing that you take away from growing up years and, and the home that you are wanting to promote to your kids as well? The way you believed in us, man, you just think we're all so great. <laughs> you think we're just amazing. And, and I know me and man, the way that you just truly believe in us and cheer for us and have our back and instilled confidence in us. I think that's, that's the thing. I, w I hope my kids know how much I believe in them, support them. I want, I want them to be confident in who they are, you know? Ah. I was going to say uh, very similar, just, I think your uh, words of affirmation, uh, there's never been a day in my entire life, and I can honestly say this, that I haven't, that I've wondered if you were proud of me, or for that very matter, if you loved me. I mean, it's so sad to say how many friends I have just never heard their dad say that they love them. Even if you never said that you loved us, we would have felt it, but you use the word all the time, and it taught, it's taught me to use the word, and uh, it's, I think it's just meant a great deal, and I'm sure that men, I'm sure that most of us are unaware just of how much more confident we are in life than than others at times because of once again because of your words and your belief in us. And so, I'm just right there with Taylor. I think the thing that I cherish so much about you, Dad, is just um, never ever um, a shortage of your encouragement. Never ever were you at a loss for words to explain approval or acceptance. I've always felt even if I was doing something silly or not behaving how you'd want me to behave, I never wondered, man, am I accepted by my dad? Does my dad approve of me? Does my dad promote me? Yeah, I think if anything in our, in me, between me and you, if there's ever been anything that has actually come up in our relationship, I'm like, dad, you gotta chill out on the promotion stuff, man. You're kind of out there promoting me too hard. These things that you say about me to other people are not true. I can't deliver, you know? But um, I would much rather be having that type of a dad than a dad who, who doesn't believe in their kids. And I just want to tell you on Father's Day just how grateful I am for you. Um, don't tell you nearly enough. Uh, I am who I am today because of you. And I'm so, so thankful. I, I, I always tell my wife, I said, if I'm going to die today, I don't know what people would say about me, but I would certainly hope that everyone that knew me well would say, Rich was the most grateful person and he loved life. That's actually how I feel in my heart. I don't know if I always live that way properly for people to see, but that's actually the belief that I have, that I am the most grateful, blessed human being ever. And um, you set me up. You set me up. And I, I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't have the marriage that I have. I wouldn't have family, friends, uh, unless it was you. And so I'm just taking time to honor you. I want to be just like you. And I want to, um, I want to stand on your shoulders. And I want to hopefully, the dreams that are in your heart, the things that you desired, your ambitions, hopefully the ones that you feel like they haven't been fulfilled or the ones that you feel like, man, I'm still trying to hit that target. Let's help you get there. But if you don't get there, hopefully you know that you've got sons that are going to try to stand on your shoulders and go further and faster. And uh, it's because of your love, because of your grace, because of your mercy for us. And so I honor you today, but um, that's what I'm taking with me. That's, that's what I cherish the most is just your words, like Taylor was saying, and your presence your presence for sure. Yeah. Love you. That's really good. Uh, kind of, kind of stole my thunder there. I mean, I, that's, I agree with everything both these guys have just said to add to that. Um, you know, being the oldest, you know, uh, just how you, how you loved our mom, you know, like I think just 
the model of what it looks like to be a husband and a father. I cherish that. I cherish uh, the life experiences that you gave us. I mean, the stuff that we got to do uh, be because of you making a way for it. It's just ridiculous. I mean, the stories, we, we can spend hours telling stories of just places that we had, we had the opportunity to travel to and, and um, just, I, I'm just, I have a, I have a, a, a litany of memories of experience that I had. And, and then just like the sacrifice that you made for our family, you know, uh, a lot of people don't understand the years you were on the road and how that was before, you know, internet and texting and all of these things. And when I look back on that, you know, uh, getting a phone call from, you know, you and, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to call you from this other number. And it just, just, just because it was just, it was so inconvenient uh, back then to communicate on the road, but you always, you always were intentional about it. You would preach all night long. And then you, I never remember you not calling every single night to talk to every one of us. Your voice was all raspy, you know, and, and then you talk to mom and, and, you know, that was, you know, I look back on that. I mean, you could have just, you could have just gone to bed, you know, and I, I just, the little things like that, you know, and so I just appreciate how you, you, you modeled what it looked like to be a, a husband. You were always in the present that I, I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about you coming and jumping into one of our games. Well, I mean, you, you getting off an airplane and, and showing up exhausted, but you didn't act like you were exhausted. You just like, you, it's like you were, you were right there. And it was like, oh, there's dad, you know, and, and you just, you maximized every opportunity and uh, it's always, it's left an impression with me. And so I like Rich and, and Taylor and Graham, like I honor you too. And, and thank you for, for setting the bar. I mean, it's going to take me a lifetime to reach it. So thanks for being an incredible dad and even more so a, a husband and um, the sacrifices that you've made and cont continue to make. And thank you for your affirmation. Thank you for your promotions when we probably weren't qualified to uh, step into that role that you were trying to connect us to. I mean, some of the things that, you know, I would sit down with whatever internship I was about to, and I'm like, yeah, your dad said A, B, and C about you. And I'm like, oh, okay, well. And so that it was just like, I just appreciate that. And so that's that's just the kind of father you are. So love you, man. <laughs> Graham? You love me. What's that, son? You love me. Oh, man. Well, I do love you, Graham. And Graham is always the one, as we wrap this up, that reminds me, Dad, I'm the one that didn't leave you. <laughs> My brothers all left you. Dad, I love you. I stay. <laughs> That's funny. Well, you guys, uh, I can't thank you enough for this. And uh, as I said earlier, I didn't mean for this to turn into uh, Rich Wilkerson's great. I, did, I didn't mean that at all. But I think um, subject of honor is very important. I'm working on a book right now called Live Forever. And the way a Christian lives forever, obviously, is to know Jesus, go to heaven someday. But also to raise a great family, men and women. And they love their children and they move on. They, they get you know, promoted to heaven. But their kids are their legacy. And they just keep living forever. I was on the phone with my mom last night. She's 90. And I got to talking about dad. And I said, Mom, I miss dad so much. And she said, I do too, son. And we talked about him. Well, my dad is living forever. He's in heaven, but he's got kids and grandkids. And they're going on for God. And I encourage you as a man of God, as a woman of God who's watching right now, to determine in your heart as a father, as a mother, I'm going to live forever. I love you so much. And gentlemen, it's been such an honor for me to have you on. John Fulton, Rich, Graham, Taylor. I'm a blessed dad. I love you. God bless. <laughs>